Hello and welcome to lecture five of volcanoes, the formation, form and function. In this lecture, I'm going to discuss uh, magma chamber initiation or magma chamber formation and some basic volcano tectonic processes. So let's start here. A major theme in this uh, uh, course is the shallow magma chamber. Now, stress concentration around the chamber controls its rupture and dike and inclined sheet injections. Here in Southeast Iceland, we see a, a swarm where the wall is nearly 100% composed of inclined sheets and radial dikes. We see the person here for scale. And we see that this swarm, even if it's so dense, did not develop into a shallow magma chamber. Similarly, here in the Oman Ophiolite, the seated dike complex is 100% dikes, but they did not merge into a shallow magma chamber. So the question is, how do shallow magma chambers really form? Well, I think most of them form from sills. Sills are sort of baby or potential shallow magma chambers. Now, most cells, of course, do not become magma chambers, but quite many do. And the critical factor is the flow of magma into the cell once it has been in place through new dikes, through new dike injections. So if you look here at the situation, we have an emplacement of a cell under a certain layer. And if the cell then receives magma from new dike injections here in the red, then it can grow and expand into a real shallow magma chamber. Then this magma chamber subsequently starts to inject dikes and probably inclined sheets that bring magma to a limited surface here, surface area. And this limited surface area becomes the polygenetic volcano, the stratovolcano, the composite volcano, the central volcano, whatever you like to call it at the surface. Sills commonly form either just under or inside, somewhere inside a unit or a layer that we call a stress barrier. Now, what is a stress barrier? Stress barrier is simply a unit or layer in the crust where the stress field is unfavorable for the formation or propagation of dikes and favorable for the formation or propagation of sills. And the magma chamber may, may then possibly develop from many small sills, but more commonly from a single sill that is comparatively large uh, and becomes a shallow magma chamber. Here is an indication of, of the solidification. Once we have a sill in place, this starts to solidify, it cools down. And for a basaltic sill, the, the, the temperature may be from 1200 degrees to 1000. And when it solidifies, the crust at the margin of the sill gradually becomes thicker. I indicate that here on the vertical axis as a function of time in years on the horizontal axis. Now remember, the time of solidification for any kind of uh, sheet injection, like sill uh, inclined sheet, is a function of the thickness of the sheet in the second power, in the power of two. And of course, when it's solidified, getting hard, it is still very hot. 1,000 degrees is, of course, very, very hot. But it's, it's solid in that sense, but not at all with the temperature of the surrounding rock. That takes a long, long time. But here's a part of a multiple 120 meter thick sill in East Iceland. Now, this sill never became a magma chamber. Why? Because it's composed of these columnar rows here, and each row solidified, each injection solidified before the next one came in. So it never could merge into a single fluid body. It was a multiple body that never had the chance to develop into a single fluid body, therefore could not develop into a, a real magma chamber. It's of course very shallow, 800 meters below the original surface of, of, the, uh, of the lava pile. Close by is uh, the top of a composite dike. This part is only acid, 35 meters thick. And this dike, in fact, changed temporarily the stress fields of sigma. One became temporarily horizontal, 
and then subsequently this cell was emplaced. So the dye was the cause of the stress field change that led to the formation of the cell. So the dye is older than the cell, the cell in fact cuts through the dye. But we see often the effect of our magma chamber formation through cell emplacement. Here is an acid one. Again, we are standing around two kilometers into the old crust below the mostly eroded old central volcano. And we can see a crude layering of stratification here in this acid gluten, this acid fossil magma chamber. And most of the sills are 15 to 50 meters thick. And they are, have been piling up here to form this shallow magma timber. Again, as I say, at two kilometers below the, below the surface at the time. Here's another fossil shallow magma chamber. Again, here we are two kilometers into the crust. Uh, this one is, is mafic, it's of, of gabbro, it's a gabbroic gluten. And there's a very sharp contact between the gabbro gluten, the old magma chamber, and the sheets, inclined sheets, and radial dikes it injected. So here, 80% of the rock is composed of seed-like intrusions, but here it is a, a gabbroic pluton. Now the sill have many types uh, or geometric forms, and uh, here are some of the common ones. In A, we have a double deflected straight sill. In B, we have a, an upward bending sill. In C, we have a single deflected straight sill. And in D, a staircase shaped sill, which uh, includes as a subgroup the well known saucer shaped or disc shaped sill people often discuss, discuss about. Now, what controls? the deflection of dike into a sill. We have mentioned already the stress-stress barrier that is shown here, but I can go through the main factors. They are a stress barrier shown here where the local stress field rotates so that there is a flip from sigma one being vertical favoring dikes to sigma one being horizontal favoring sills. Then there is a Cook-Gordon delamination uh, there we have a weak contact uh, in weak intention that opens up partly when the dike approaches and the dike becomes deflected into the open part of the contact. And finally, we have elastic mismatch where there's a sharp contrast between Young's modulus or stiffness in one layer and the layer below. And in comparison with the Young's modulus of the, of the contact itself. Now, stress barriers can form in many ways. Uh, one is that, uh, maybe surprised to some people, is that a rapid subsidence on a graben in a rift zone can temporarily flip the stress field so that sigma one, which was vertical and favoring graben subsidence, becomes horizontal for a while. When the graben presses down the piece of rock or presses down here, it may change into the wedge shape down here. It may change the stress field so it becomes a horizontal compression. So this becomes sigma one, and the dike becomes either totally arrested or possibly becomes deflected into a sill here at this contact. Elastic mismatch or contrast in Young's modulus shown here between layer A and layer B. Uh, is so that uh, that contrast, particularly in relation to the Young's modulus of the contact itself, often favors deflection of the dike into a sill along the contact, particularly if layer A has a high Young's modulus and layer B has a comparatively low Young's modulus. In addition, I'll show here the effect of opening of the contact, namely the Cook Gordon delamination. So in Fig A, this is the situation, dike is approaching the contact, and in B, it has become deflected along the contact as a sail. One thing to remember is that uh, 
if the magma chamber is long lasting, lives for a long time, uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, it cannot maintain a highly irregular boundary, highly irregular contact as indicated, indicated here. Why? Because the part of the chamber that project into the hostra, they become solidified quickly. And the part of the chamber that project into the magma melts quickly. So gradually the chamber gets a smooth boundary, like I indicate in the broken line here. So when I talk about the general shapes of magma chambers, we refer to chambers with relatively smooth geometries, not highly irregular, because those are mechanically and thermally unstable. And we see it in the field, of course. If you go in the field, we look at the contact between the fossil magma chamber here, partly felsic and partly mafic, and the roof, the contact is relatively smooth. We see this everywhere when we look at fossil magma chambers. We are not seeing highly irregular contacts, we are seeing smooth contacts because of this thermal and mechanical stability that needs to be achieved. So the ideal geometries, of course, uh, real magma chambers do not really have the ideal geometries, but some of them are not far from it. And this is what we use as a basic models, a spherical one, an oblate ellipsoid that we often refer to as a sill-like magma chamber, and then a prolate ellipsoid. And the sill-like chamber is probably the most common one. It can be a pure oblate ellipsoid, or it can be a tunnel-shaped tunnel one, as I'll discuss later. So what is the condition for magma chamber rupture? Well, we have to go into a little bit of physics here. Fortunately, very simple. The condition is very simple. The total magmatic pressure must reach the minimum principal compressive stress, sigma three, plus the tensile strength, T zero. Alternatively, we can rewrite it as lithostatic pressure plus excess pressure must reach sigma three plus T zero which means, of course, that PT, the total pressure, must be equal to the lithostatic plus the excess pressure. And excess pressure is always the pressure in the chamber in excess of sigma, sigma three. So once the dike has started to propagate, in addition to the excess pressure, which is basically equal to the tensile strength of the rock, in the magma chamber, there is a buoyancy term. What is the buoyancy term? In this equation here is the difference between the density of the host rock, rho r, minus, uh, and the density of the magma, rho r, rho m, multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity, lowercase g, and the height of the dike, or the level of the dike in the crust if it's still propagating. And we have, in addition, sigma d, which is the different layer stress, the difference between sigma 1 and sigma 3, where the dike is located, if it's still propagating, or where it's located, uh, where it was arrested or is exposed in the crest. And I show here a dike, and the sigma d is indicated here. This is the dike inside an old volcano in Iceland, the person for scale, and the uh, host rock stresses are here the geostatic or overburden pressure in this area here, as sigma d is, is the, the, the different stress or stress difference. So here is an example of a dike deflecting into a sill. It comes up here, here's a contact between mechanically slightly different rocks, and it follows here in one direction, in one direction. Of course, the sill is only 60 centimeters thick and the dike is only 20 centimeters thick. So these are very small features, but the principles, the principles for large sill and on a thick dike are exactly the same. The, the physical principles are, are exactly the same. So sills are modeled as mode one cracks with internal fluid overpressure. And there are two basic geometric models one is the tunnel-shaped model, 
where the third dimension here, the dimension in the direction of the z axis is much larger, strictly speaking infinite, but of course in reality not. So we, we just say it's, it's, it's many times larger than the dimension and direction of x axis or the dimension and direction of y axis. So this here is a tunnel shaped model. The other one is the circular silk, a penny shaped or coin shaped silk, as we discuss often. So here we have the equation for first the tunnel shaped silk and then the circular sill. So the overpressure is PO, nu is the Poisson's ratio, L is the lateral dimension, pi is of course pi, and E is Young's modulus. So from these equations, depending on the model we use, we can calculate either the likely displacement or opening or thickness of the sill, or if we know the dimensions of the sill, we can calculate the overpressure when it was forming. Provided we, of course, have good information about Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, as we often have. So here is a sail in East Iceland uh, and placed around 1200 meters below the original surface, where a tunnel shaped model would be appropriate. So this is the front of the sail, the eroded front of the sail, and the z dimension will then go into into the rocks, into the mountain here. So this would be the x dimension, this would be the y dimension, and the z dimension, based on the model I just showed you, would go into the mountain. Here are some farms in Iceland as a scale. Here is a, a, a sill in Tenerife, we have seen earlier in these lectures, and there, I would say the circular model would be a more, more appropriate. So this is the this is the shape of the sill. It's slightly uh, inclined, slightly dipping down down uh, the slope here. But the circular model would probably be most appropriate. So it's a kind of oblate ellipsoid that we are talking about really for this sill here. Now, some uh, magma chambers that look like sills are in reality a lacolis that is slightly a mushroom shape. And the most famous is this one here in Chile, which is one of the most uh, wonderful magma, shallow magma chambers, fossil ones in the world. It's so beautifully exposed here. You see the roof there, you see the floor there. This is around two kilometers. This is an acid uh, magma chamber, felsic magma chamber. I was active around 12 million years ago. I mentioned it often in, in, in these lectures because uh, it's so fantastically well exposed and gives so much information. There are a lot of dikes and inclined sheets that go through the roof. Uh, so this was definitely an active magma chamber around 12 million years ago. Here are some other lacolites. Uh, one is uh, extremely well demonstrated here in East Iceland. Uh, this again is an acid, acid luckily, a very shallow depth, uh, 700 meters, six, 700 meters. And we see it has lifted up the basaltic lava flows. They are dipping here around 30, maybe 35 degrees, whereas the normal dip here is around eight, eight, nine degrees. So this intrusion, this mushroom shaped intrusion lifted up the layers here. A similar one is in West Iceland, except that the roof is not exposed there. So here the part of the roof is obviously exposed, but here the roof has been all eroded away, so we don't really see anything similar. But this again is a lack of it, and is again an acid, an acid uh, magma chamber. Both of these were very, very small, so they were active for a short period of time. Not uh, These are not long-lived or long-lasting uh, uh, shallow magma chambers. So here are some of the common forms of magma chambers. You can have lacoliths, mushroom shaped. You can have a lobolith where it's down bending. And then we can have a combination of, of both as indicated here. And of course, there are many other geometries. These are just some, some typical ones. So now we come to collapses in volcanoes. They are of two main types. 
vertical collapses, namely caldera collapses, and lateral collapses, namely landslides. So we focus in, in this course on the form because they are more important, but landslides can have important effects in volcanoes. They can particularly trigger some, some eruptions, uh, as, as uh, history shows that they have done. So mechanically, uh, caldera collapses in a way similar to a graben, as I indicate here. In both cases, there is shear displacement, a fault, a boundary fault. Uh, and uh, the displacement uh, is, of course, slightly different in geometry. In, in, in the boundary faults or the displacement faults are different in geometry, namely elongated here for the graben and circle or slightly elliptical for a colder fault. And in addition, of course, the displacement on a fault, the large displacement up to one or two kilometers or even more, occurs often very rapidly on a fault in a, in a colder, whereas it takes a much longer time often in, in a graphic. So the colder is sometimes the displacement, hundreds of meters or even kilometers is associated with one, one event. One, one eruption, for example, in a coltera, whereas a graben may uh, develop over a very long period of time. Here are some examples. This uh, uh, well-exposed and very clear collapse coltera in, in the Galapagos uh, is the Fernandina coltera. Uh, it collapsed in 1968 and there were 70 to 80 slips on the ring fault, and each slip gave rise to a recorded earthquake. So this was the first well-monitored, well-documented collapse through modern instruments, the first one. We had a very similar one in Kilauea uh, recently, where again, the, the total slip formed in numerous smaller slips. I will discuss that uh, later in, 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 the, in the course. Here is the Las Cañadas Collapse Caldera. Uh, it is in fact not a single one. It is several collapses, several one, two, and three. And if we go back here again to it, so one, two, and three. So here's the youngest one, it's here. Then comes the next one, goes down to here, roughly. And the third one is somewhere here. We see the difference in that the oldest one, which is around one million year old, has very eroded uh, margins or fault walls. Whereas the youngest one here, which is around 200,000 years old, has very little erosion, in fact, hardly any erosion here. Then following this last one, 200,000 years ago, or maybe 180,000 years ago, a new volcano, strata volcano form, Teide, and that covers part of the, of the collapse uh, caldera here, buried. Some people believe this is a, a, a gigantic landslide, but uh, it seems to me that, particularly given that the, the uh, erosion of the colder walls is very, very different along the colder, it indicates that this one is much, much younger, not eroded at all than this one here. So there cannot be a single event. It must be many events. In this case, we think there are three events, one, one, million, year, one million year ago, the old one around 0.6 million years ago and the youngest one 180,000 or 200,000 years ago, something like that. It's a peak cold era. And the maximum diameter is slightly elliptical, it's around 17 kilometers. And uh, the displacement here, but what we see is up to 500 meters, but it's probably much more than that. To form a ring fault, is not easy, is not easy. It requires very special stress conditions, which of course is the one reason why in a given volcano, collapses, colder collapses are rare, 
incompatible with the number of dikes and inclined seats that are injected from the volcano. There's, a, there's nothing comparable there. In fact, when you have an existing uh, collapse caldera, it may not slip. In most cases, when it's, the volcano is active, there is no slip on, on the collapse caldera, even if it exists. So the conditions, stress conditions are very rare. You see here a, a, a typical simple numerical model. If this magma chamber, the circular cross section, is subject to the horizontal tension here, indicated here, the stresses concentrate here, the tensile stresses concentrate here above the top of the magma chamber and would therefore favor dike injections and not a ring fault here above the margin of the chamber. For a ring fault to form, the shear stresses and at the surface tensile stresses have to concentrate above the margin of the chamber here. And as I say, it's not easy to get that. We have done tens of numerical models with various shapes of magma chambers to generate shear stresses above the margins. And it seems to be that the requirement to generate such a stress field is that you have a large magma reservoir that gives rise to a slight doming, slight uplift here. The uplift can be of the order of, of centimeters or, or something very small, but it's needed to concentrate the stresses here and here rather than somewhere here that would lead to dikes or inclined seats. So it's ring fault formation is not easy, is not easy. What do the faults look like in the field? Well, here we have an example. This is from Iceland, West Iceland. There's an old uh, central volcano, uh, fossil volcano. And we see the ring fault here. It's a displacement of, of a couple of hundred meters. This has subsided relative to that one here. The ring fault is very close to verticals, very steeply dipping, but slightly inward dipping. So it's a normal ring fault, a normal one, not a reverse one. So why are ring faults so often close to vertical? Well, one reason is that when a fault, a shear fracture forms, it usually makes an angle roughly of 30, 20, 30 degrees to the maximum principal compressive stress, sigma one. And because around the magma chamber, that stress, that tick is inclined, not vertical, therefore, the resulting shear fracture becomes vertical. So this angle here could be 30 degrees. This one here is of course very schematic, but it could be 30 degrees and therefore the fault tends to be close to vertical. They can be dipping inward or outward. So inward we call normal fault ring faults or normal ring faults and outward dipping a reverse fault ring fault or reverse ring faults. So as I said, the requirements seem to be that we have a, a shallow magma chamber and preferably sill-like or oblate ellipsoidal magma chamber with a slight doming here in the deep reservoir. And then the stresses, the red is the highest stress and, and the blue is the lowest stress. The stress is concentrated here above the margin so we could get a ring fault here and a ring fault there. The ring fault here and the ring fault there. And that would favor, as I say, collapse caldera formation. This model, however, is homogeneous and isotropic as a non layered. And we all know that that is maybe not the most realistic way of modeling uh, stratovolcanoes or, or, or crustal segments that have a lot of layers. So we can look here at a model where we have layering. So a lot of layers here above the magma chamber. The first one we look at is a chamber with a circular cross-section, vertical cross-section. And then we look at the tensile shear stresses at the surface here on the left, surface above the magma chamber, and around the magma chamber, the margin of the magma chamber here on the right. And yes, at the surface, there are two peaks. There's one peak uh, here, and will be another peak here. So that would in a way favor ring fault formation, but when we look at the stresses around the chamber itself, the margin of the chamber, they're highest here. 
at the top of the chamber, here. So that would favor dike injection, not ring fault here or ring fault there. It would favor a dike injection here. So this shape of a magma chamber is not very favorable for a ring fault formation. It's not impossible, but it's not very favorable. A much more favorable one, as I said before, is a sill-like or oblate ellipsoidal magma chamber, because for the same doming, slight doming from the deep-seated reservoir, this is the shallow chamber, this is the deep-seated reservoir, we have at the surface two peaks of the shear stress and the tensile stress, so they favor a ring fault here, a ring fault here at the surface, and also, and that's the most important thing, at the margin of the chamber. So both the tensile stress, sigma three, and the shear stress tau, they peak above the margin, the lateral ends of the magma chamber. So this all together favors ring fault formation and therefore a colder collapse. So we are dealing with doming from the reservoir, shallow magma chamber of a sill-like geometry. That seems to be the most favorable condition for the formation of a ring fault and therefore for a collapse called reformation. We will discuss later how the cold reformation affects the size of the eruption. We discuss large eruptions later on in, in the course. And there we discuss that the dip of the fault, whether it's inward or normal fault, ring fault, or outward or reverse fault, ring fault, has great effects on the potential size of the eruption. So it's of huge importance, and we discuss, as I say, later how that affects the size of the likely, likely eruption when, when the caldera collapse is associated with the eruption, which is not always the case. You can have caldera collapses without any eruption. In fact, we have had several of that, but I discuss that all later in, in the lectures. A few words in the end of this talk about lateral collapses or landslides, they can trigger eruptions. And the famous case is St. Helens in the United States in 1980, where a landslide apparently triggered an eruption. Now, where are landslides in volcanoes most, most common or most likely to occur? They're most likely to occur where the volcano is relatively weak. That means, when it's relatively easy to fracture it. And shield volcanoes or basaltic edifices like this one here in A are much weaker in this sense than strata volcanoes or composite volcanoes like in B. It's much easier to arrest the propagation of any kind of fracture in a strata volcano where there are layers of widely different mechanical properties than in a shield volcano or lava shield where the layers have very similar mechanical properties. So this applies to dike propagation. It's much easier to go through and to the surface in a shield volcano than in a strata volcano, and applies also to landslides, which we see here. So in a strata volcano or composite volcano, there is much more likely, much more, more, more likelihood that a propagating shear fracture that could become a landslide fracture becomes arrested, stops at some of the contacts than in a basaltic edifice or a sealed volcano where all the layers are similar, which would imply in, in, in our considerations that, uh, that landslides, big landslides are more common in, in shield volcanoes or basaltic edifices than in strata volcanoes. And that seems to be the case, but as I say here, there hasn't been very thorough study of the frequency or number of large landslides in, in, in big shield volcanoes versus uh, landslide frequencies in, in large strata volcanoes. This is obviously a topic for, for future research, maybe some of my, my, my uh, students would uh, like to, to look into that. But I'll show you here an example from Hawaii. The new, there are, of course, uh, uh, shield volcanoes or basaltic edifices, and there are a huge number of landslides everywhere here around the islands. 
So they are very, very common. And some of them really big up to 5,000 cubic kilometers in, in, in volume. So they are really, really big and very frequent. And I just show you here at the end, uh, the uh, part of uh, uh, Hawaii Islands that is affected by landslides here. They have been illustrated here. And uh, these high cliffs here are then generated in giant landslides in giant lateral collapses. So I stop there. This has been a rather long talk, sorry for that. And uh, um, we stop here and uh, I say just uh, many thanks and uh, bye bye for now.